The equilibrium price is also known as the market sale price. Graphically, you will note that the equilibrium price and quantity are where the supply and demand curves intersect. This is an important point to recognize and remember. Note that it is not correct to say supply equals demand. In this example, we have taken the market supply and demand schedules from part one and part two and graphed them together. The intersection of the downsloping demand curve, D, and the upsloping supply curve, S, indicates the equilibrium price of $3 and the equilibrium quantity of 7,000 bushels of corn per week. If producers offer 7,000 bushels of corn at the price of $3, consumers will purchase all of it, leaving no surplus or shortage. The rationing function of prices is the ability of competitive forces of supply and demand to establish a price where buying and selling decisions are coordinated, therefore minimizing the chances of a surplus or a shortage. At equilibrium, the markets are efficient. A shortage occurs when the price is set too low. For example, a market price of $2 would cause consumers to demand 10,000 bushels, but suppliers are only willing and able to produce 4,000. This shortage, if left alone, would drive up the price, forcing the market back to the equilibrium as producers make more and consumers demand less at the higher price level. A surplus occurs when the price is set too high. In the example, a price of $4 would cause consumers to demand 4,000 bushels, but suppliers will offer 10,000. The surpluses caused by above equilibrium prices push the price down. As the price drops, the quantity demanded rises and the quantity supplied falls until equilibrium is established. Competitive markets generate productive efficiency, the production of any particular good in the least costly way. Sellers that don't achieve the least cost combination of inputs will be unprofitable and have difficulty competing in the market. The competitive process also generates allocative efficiency, which means producing the combination of goods and services most valued by society. Allocative efficiency requires that there be productive efficiency. Allocative and productive efficiency occur at the equilibrium price and quantity in a competitive market. Resources are neither over nor under allocated based on society's wants. As explained in part one, determinants of demand other than price, such as change in consumer tastes, cause a shift in the curve. When this occurs, assuming supply remains constant, the equilibrium price is also affected. An increase in demand results in an increase in price and an increase in quantity exchanged. A decrease in demand results in a decrease in price and a decrease in the equilibrium quantity. The same is true when determinants in supply other than price cause a shift in the supply curve, only with different results for equilibrium. An increase in supply results in a decrease in price and an increase in the quantity exchanged. A decrease in supply results in an increase in price and a decrease in the quantity exchanged. In some instances, government may artificially inflate prices on a good or keep the price of a good down. There are several reasons why they may do this, many with good intentions, but the result is always the same, surpluses and shortages. Price ceilings are maximum prices that can be charged on a good. Price ceilings are set on goods that are considered to be necessities, but the equilibrium price is so high that many people are unable to purchase the item. To avoid shortages, the price ceiling must be set below the equilibrium price. When price ceilings are placed above a good's equilibrium price, this creates a chronic shortage, which makes it difficult to determine how to ration the limited output for all of the consumers who are willing and able to buy the good. The shortages often lead to black markets, where the good is sold at a higher price than the price ceiling. Price ceilings distort the efficient allocations of resources. A typical example you might see in the United States are price gouging laws that prevent firms from increasing their prices following a natural disaster. An example of a price ceiling can be seen in the following graph. Line PC is the government's price ceiling. When the ceiling price is below the equilibrium price, a persistent product shortage results. Here, that shortage is shown by the horizontal distance between QD, quantity demanded, and QS, quantity supplied. Price floors are minimum prices that can be charged for a good. 
Price floors are placed on goods that are considered to be necessities, but the equilibrium price is so low that it discourages production of the good. To avoid surpluses, the prices must be set above the equilibrium market price. If it is set too low, it will result in persistent surpluses in the market. Price floors distort the efficient allocation of resources. The effects of a price floor can be seen in the following graph. Notice PF, representing the government's price floor, has been set above the equilibrium price. When the price floor is above the equilibrium price, a persistent product surplus results. Here, that surplus is shown by the horizontal distance between the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded. The issues that markets can present aren't always cut and dry. Take for example organ transplants. Organ transplants have become increasingly common, but not everyone who needs a transplant can get one. In 2005 there were 89,000 Americans on the waiting list. It is estimated that there are 4,000 deaths per year in the U.S. because not enough organs are available. Why do we have shortages? One possible answer is that no market exists for human organs. The demand curve for human organs would resemble others in that a greater quantity would be demanded at lower prices than at higher prices. Donated organs that are rationed by a waiting list have a price of zero. The existing supply is a fixed quantity offered by willing donors so there is a shortage of human organs due to the fact that at a zero price the quantity demanded exceeds the quantity supplied. Obviously, there are negative reasons that have prevented the creation of an organ market. The first negative effect is a moral objection that turning human organs into commodities commercializes human beings and diminishes the special nature of human life. An analytical critique based on the elasticity of supply suggests that an increase in the actual number of usable organs for transplants would not be likely. A health cost concern suggests that a market for body organs would greatly increase the cost of health care. Prohibitions on a human organ market have given rise to a worldwide $1 billion per year illegal market. There is concern that those willing to participate in a legal market such as this may also be willing to take extreme measures to solicit organs from unwilling donors while they are unconscious or by killing them. Supporters of legalizing the market for organs argue this point, saying that it would increase the supply of legal organs, drive down the price of organs, and reduce the harvesting of organs from unwilling sellers due to the fact that the lower price would make it less profitable.